Turbo Smart is one of the market leaders with turbo support products such as wastegates and blow-off valves. Obviously, they create a lot of other products as well, including fuel pressure regulators. More recently, though, they've jumped into the turbo charger market, and we're here with Matt from Turbo Smart to talk a little bit more about that leap. Now, on face value, Matt, I guess it kind of closes the loop and is a natural progression considering you provide all of the other support products around the turbocharger. But this is also a very mature market and on face value it does seem like quite a big leap to start manufacturing your own. Can you talk a little bit about the impetus behind this jump? That's exactly as you said. We Everything that we sell goes onto a turbo car, pretty much by nothing. Wastegates, blow-off valves, uh, even the fuel pressure rigs. You know, we know that 95% of them are going onto turbo cars. So, And every single day you get a phone call hey, you guys are turbo smart, do you smell turbos? And the answer for you know, 26, seven years in the company's history has been no. So that changed at the beginning of this year where the answer is yes. So, I mean, half of the job that we do as a manufacturer of products in the aftermarket is making a product. But the other half of the job is having customers who can install the product and then also supporting the product after it's sold. So we've done a great job in making uh, wastegates and blow-off valves, um, fuel pressure eggs. We've got a lot of great customers. And so it was a natural progression to go, okay, well, you know, what's the next thing? What what is every one of our customers use in their builds? And the answer to that is, I mean, loud and clear in neon lights, turbochargers. And so it's always been a, a goal. Uh, it's been a goal of the companies for a long time. You speak to Nick, our company owner, he's like, yeah, I wanted to make turbochargers since day one, but, you know, how do you get into that? So you kind of to grow to a point where you you have the ability in, in both um, manpower and capital. It's a, it's a really capital in, intensive thing to do. You know, there's, there's a lot of molding involved. So there's a lot of tooling costs, um, finding the right suppliers and getting the right people. It's, it's a long development process. There's a lot of computing power that goes into the design of the thing. So you sort of have to mature to a point where you know, you've got the ability to put all the pieces together and we got sort of that far as a company. And so it's, um, it made a lot of sense. And uh, you know, a couple of years back, we sort of pulled the trigger and, and now here we are, we can actually touch and feel and, and use the things, which is cool. Now, I've been dealing with turbochargers since I first got into the performance automotive industry and granted like over that 20 plus years the, the market has matured, we've seen massive advances and I think particularly maybe in the last five to ten years there's sort of been this exponential improvement and you're getting more power, more airflow with more response kind of ticking all of the boxes. There's also a lot of competition in this market. On face value it seems like it would be a market that's A quite difficult to break into and B, you're going to really want to come in with a point of difference and I want to focus on that. What is it that you feel brings a point of difference to these turbo smart uh, turbochargers? You're absolutely right. It's it's a big market and there's already a lot of players in there, um, OEMs and aftermarket. So one of the things that turbo smart has had expertise in for a long time is airflow. Like that's everything that we do with wastegates, we optimize for airflow. Um, and the other side of turbos is obviously they're in the exhaust. So material science is is quite a big part of it. And so we had a lot of expertise in both um, the material side, science side of things, you know, being able to select the right materials, machine the right materials, and then post machine the right materials to stay in the harshest environments in the performance aftermarket. Um, so we had the material science down, um, that knowledge is in house. We also have the you know, the airflow aerodynamic side of things and the other big part of this is computing power so unlike i guess some of a lot of the competition where they've been in the market for a lot of years um, the development process over the decades has been you know you design a turbo based on what theoretically should work you build the thing and then you make adjustments now it's really only been the last couple of years where you've actually been able to get the computer processing power to model in cfd um, a full turbocharger and even now like the software that you have to use to design compressor side turbine side things and and analyze that and optimize those designs you have to rent it at hundreds of thousands of dollars a year it's not it's not like something you can just you know download online or yeah you, know, you pay five grand it's not like windows this is very specific software you need dedicated engineers to use it they're dealing with dedicated engineers to make adjustments for you in the software company it's it's a couple of packages that you rent um, it's big bucks like it's, it's more than full-time employees, but what it does allow you to do is optimize your aerodynamic designs. Now, material science, we had a really good handle on that. The machining side of things, we have a really good handle on that. Um, we've been doing that for nearly 30 years. So when something like the, the software packages come along that allow you to optimize the design and go from sort of nothing to 
quite an optimized aerodynamic design in a, a relatively short period of time. It's still a couple of years, but you can get there, you couple on what you already know about the material science. And it gave us a bit of a, I think we were in a unique opportunity, a unique position to be able to say, all right, we've got customers, we've got a market, we're already selling products into the market. Now we can actually sort of fast track the aerodynamic performance through computer optimization. Uh, and that's, that's given us the ability to go from probably a 10 or 15 year on ramp to you know, three or four years. To so if, if I kind of break down what you're saying here, essentially, you know, if we rewind maybe five or even 10 years ago, the, the process was much more manual in terms of you come up with a design, but you couldn't really validate that in the virtual world. So it'd be a case of manufacturing an actual turbocharger based on that part, then testing it in the real world, seeing if it did what you thought it would do, and then going through an iterative process of redevelopment. Now you can do most of that in the virtual world obviously as you mentioned the software is incredibly expensive but I'm guessing much much less expensive than going through five years of iterative prototypes of actual turbochargers so when you come up with a finished product it should perform as per the CFD as per the aerodynamics and do what you expect that's the idea it doesn't always work that way yeah of course uh, and, and so the software is not perfect but what it does do is it shortcuts that process you can have an idea uh, where you think you know fundamentally this should work run through the CFD software, but sometimes things come up and you go, oh wow, that was just a straight flop. Something as simple as, you know, what number of turbine blades, what is the angle you're going to have, um, uh, what is the difference um, in you know, inducer to exercise? size, where are the limits in those things, and different turbo applications do require sort of, um, it's very specific. Uh, and so there's a lot of idiosyncrasies and it's finding that middle ground. So you still do real world validation, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, but you're fast tracking that process yeah. and you're going to be closer to the mark, hopefully, from the get go. Yeah, you sort of end up with two or three designs. You say, okay, these are the three different things that we're specifically looking at. Um, you know, fundamentally, your base design is good and you might make three changes where maybe the software can't model it. That happens a lot. You say, all right, cool, let's make those changes and then we'll go to the real world. But you're not three years and 15 designs down um, before you figure that out, you know. And so that's where, you know, the mindset has been. It's like, all right, let's, let's fast track what we're doing um, and put some things into production, which is what we've been able to do. A lot of real world testing and validation. Um, and it's done really well. Uh, and so I think, yeah, fundamentally, that design process has been shortened um, from I want to make a turbocharger till I can have something that I've designed on the market. Now Coming into this as well, just to sort of speak to the elephant in the room here, you, you haven't sort of started from ground zero, essentially, you, you have actually partnered with someone who has a lot of experience with turbochargers, so that sort of fast tracked your development and kind of got you to market with something that's on point from day one, essentially. Yeah, correct, so that's exactly right, so that's the ability you have to bring in some expertise, and so you're not starting from scratch, um, with that said, you still take the designs that, and you have a proven, a proven working model that still then goes over to, okay, let's actually do a bit of analysis on the existing designs and which is exactly what we have done and what we continue to do. Um, and you make changes on that. And so even now, some of the designs uh, and some of the uh, inner workings of the turbos have changed from those initial designs that have been in production for some years um, for, for a bunch of different reasons. But you go ahead, you make a design, you make a change, you run it through your software analysis. And you go, okay, these things should make a difference. This should move the needle. Uh, you make those changes in the real world and that's what we're kind of running. So yeah, it's um, definitely having um, someone like Harry who's been uh, a contractor for a couple of years now for us uh, on board, who's got 20 years of real world experience. A lot of that um, experience is really great from a perspective of, oh, you know what, um, these BMW customers, there's a lot of those guys that want a T4 divided manifold in a 110 AR. So, Having the market knowledge of the specific ARs and flanges, that's huge. Um, from a wheel design, not a lot changes on the hot side of things. There's a few tricks in there. Um, on the compressor side of things, that comes down to individual manufacturers have their different things they're trying to chase. There's a lot to, like I said, the inducer, exducer ratios, um, extended tip, non-extended tip, um, surge lights, no surge lights. There is some detail in there and different manufacturers are going for different things. Um, longevity, um, outright boost pressure, um, pressure ratio across the, the turbo itself becomes important. So there's a few things in there that you sort of have to say, okay, this is my customer, not ch chasing an OEM truck, yeah. for example, um, or you know, 
we want fast spool over anything else with the racing application. You know, you want to be able to go on and off the throttle. If it doesn't last for a million kilometers, that's okay. We're happy to rebuild the thing after, you know, 150,000. But if the thing spools quicker, makes more boost, makes more power because you've got less exhaust back pressure, so the engine is breathing better. Now, all of these are considerations that a turbo manufacturer has to think about. Um, you know, if you're making a, a turbo to go onto an OEM truck, that thing needs to last for a million miles without a hiccup. But so completely different requirements yeah. from, from the get-go. Now, there was two things that you just brought up there. One of them you've kind of answered for me was how you decide what mar what turbos to bring to market. I mean, obviously, that's that's a massive market and people want everything from 150 horsepower to 3,000 plus, and you can't be everything to everyone. So obviously, leveraging that knowledge from Harry, you, you partnered with there, makes a lot of sense. And obviously then, there's going to be development in terms of you see requests for particular models. It's going to be a bit of a, a fluid sort of development. The other part I'm just interested, obviously turbo spot internally, I see your core strengths as you already talked about material, understanding the material strengths and what materials will work, uh, casting and CNC machining. Uh, what part of the turbo manufacturing are you doing in-house versus out outsourcing? So within our factory in Sydney, not a lot happens. Um, so. A few reasons for that is the machines that, that we have operate on a much larger scale. So bigger bars, um, bigger tools. So it's not that we can't, it's that it's actually less efficient on the size of our machines that we use for waste gates to do a lot of manufacturing in our facility. Uh, so most like, pretty much like every turbo manufacturer, most of the actual manufacturing is done overseas. Um, assembly even happens overseas. We bring it back, we do a lot of QC in house, we can do some balancing. Um, but most of the design work on the production turbos actually happens overseas. But then again, that's the same as every turbo manufacturer. Um, and the facilities that exist overseas, you can't cast a stainless steel housing in Australia. It, they, there's just no foundry to do it. Um, and so most of the, the castings happens overseas. By the time you have to cast the turbine wheel and turbine housing and then a core overseas, you're like, you may as well get those guys to assemble it and balance it. Yeah, oh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Leverage the strengths of these companies that are doing it day in and day out. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. When it comes to the design work, um, all of the inputs to that, that all happens either in Australia or the US. Yeah, so. All right, in terms of, is this still a product that is relatively new to market? How has the uptake been? What have sort of been the, the big things that you found out that you didn't know when you went into this? There's a lot of things that I found out I didn't know, but um, look, firstly, to answer the first question, the uptake's been really good. So feedback from customers using the things has been awesome. Um, so that's something that, you know, you release a new product, um, especially a product that, you know, it's, it's, it's totally new for us. Yes, we've known a lot about turbos and about turbo systems, but when the rubber hits the road, they need to actually be installed on vehicles. Like, okay, it's a lot of investment in this, you cross your fingers and hope that the, the market sort of likes them because a lot of this market is, a, it's a little bit about feel. Uh, and so it's, um, we've had no negative feedback about performance. That's obviously the, the perfect answer there. That's what, well, I mean, that, but that's our market too. We're in the performance market, and that's what we've optimised the turbo for. Um, you know, if if you put one of our turbos onto a truck engine, for example, you might not be happy with it because it might come on too quickly. You're not interested in that, but you know, it doesn't doesn't last a million miles. So it very much is horses for courses. So that's what we focused on: getting the thing to perform well. So no no, no performance complaints there, which has you know, been a really great thing. In terms of choosing a, a turbocharger, th this has always been a, a tricky part for a consumer and I mean obviously most enthusiasts aren't turbocharger experts. Is this something they can come to TurboSmart for and say, hey I've got my 2JZ or my RB26 or my 4G63, this is the application, this is the power target. Are you able to help guide them with a turbo selection and then turbine AR, these sorts of key metrics that we need to understand in order to get a turbocharger that actually is fit for our application. Yeah, that's certainly a possibility. So there's compressor maps and things on the website and you have different ARs and flanges. So speaking to that question in particular, it's interesting, right? So very rough rule of thumb, you say, okay, you can probably make 10.3 horsepower per pound of air going into the engine, you know, rough kind of number. So it's all about airflow. You know, ultimately, there's X amount of horsepower for Y amount of airflow going into the engine, air, mass flow. You can get mass flow into the engine from pressure. Um, obviously, engine capacity comes into it. But more or less, you's, you've got a horsepower number, and that's going to equate to how much air you need to put into the engine. So that's going to size the, the compressor that's side the of the, side the turbo. Of the that's exactly right. And that's what you know. I think a lot of people get confused about, because you get compressor maps everywhere. But you're like, OK, that's cool. But what turbo do I need? And, and it's a fair question, because if you've got 
you know, a high revving, low capacity engine, then you know, you, to make a thousand horsepower, you still need the same cold side. You need to be able to move X volume worth of air, mass worth of air. But because you've got low revving and uh, high revving engine that's low capacity, um, you can make that horsepower, that airflow is all higher in the RPM range. So horsepower being torque times RPM, um, that's a different turbo to say a five litre or a six or eight litre engine that might be making you know, a thousand horsepower at 3,800 RPM. Totally different turbo, totally different hot side, even different cold side. So you know, there, there's a bit of nuance in there, um, but uh, the easiest thing to, and the other, the other thing you always forget about is like, yeah, and there's the practical side of what manifold do you even have? Like someone's got a T4 manifold, are they gonna go ahead, cut all that off, put a V band on there, whatever it might it's be. It's a bit of work. It's a bit of work, that's exactly right. So the practical sort of actual application work. So, you know, there is a bit to it, um, which is why we've got, uh, you know, tech support guys and sales guys that are on the phone. I mean, I think that's probably the key for, for most enthusiasts is, first of all, we can see what other people have achieved with our engine, with XYZ type of turbocharger, so that's gonna be a good guide, but ultimately, if they can actually get some support and help and choose that turbocharger, I think that's gonna be the, the key to making the right decision. It's obviously an expensive purchase, so we don't really wanna to have to make that purchase two or even three times to get the right result, correct? That's exactly right, and the other thing is, we've been really lucky in that the customer base that we have, we have really good relationships with most of our customers. The workshops are actually installing and fitting our products. I mean, they're ultimately the experts in the specific engine that you're dealing with. Typically, that's the way you know, it goes. Whereas, you know, one workshop, you really specialize in 2Js or RBs, or BMWs, whatever the case may be. Um, those guys are actually the ultimate source of truth in a lot of regards because they're the ones using the product on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, they're often really well equipped to say, you know what, you need a T4 divided housing on sinks that comes up quickly, but you want a 110 AR so the thing will breathe it higher up in. No, you don't need that sort of AR if you're an RB versus BMW or whatever the case may be. Those guys tend to have that specific experience in your particular engine type. So, you know, we partner with those guys as well, but we're really lucky to have great customers that are able to answer a lot of questions. All right, Matt, great to get some insight into the product range. It's really exciting to see Turbo Smart really expand into this, this product. And uh, we look forward to seeing it mature and seeing what else comes out as there's more and more customer uptake. If people do want to find out more about the range of turbos, or for that matter, all the Turbo Smart products, where are they best to go? Well, firstly, I just want to thank you guys for the same thing. Bringing this sort of information to the market is super important. And, um, no, we, we really appreciate the, the knowledge and um, the education that you guys bring to the market because they really ultimately that helps us. <laughs> That's we try. Otherwise, we're doing it. Um, it's you know, it's an unbiased opinion which we really appreciate. Uh, so, Turbo Smart specifically, obviously, you've got the website turbosmart.com. Um, we've got a YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, all the usual. So you can check us out on all those locations. Perfect. Thanks for your time, Matt. Thanks, mate. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.